Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Mark here. So today we're going to be doing a deep dive into solid etalon hydrogen alpha filters. We're going to look at the Daystar quark chromosphere and the solar spectrum 0.3 angstrom solid etalon. You'll see real images from both systems so you can judge the performance differences for yourself. Here's the short version. The Quark is an affordable grab-and-go entry into hydrogen alpha viewing if you already have a small refractor. Many owners get great results, while others report variability, tuning drift, and uneven contrast. My particular Quark is a good one, and I've taken some outstanding photos with it. The solar spectrum etalon is engineered for stability, precision, and uniformity. It produces brighter and sharper images despite having a narrower band pass. It's more expensive and requires additional hardware, but the performance difference is significant and consistent. It's what I use now for high resolution solar imaging. Everything in this video is based on my experience combined with well-documented community data and publicly available spectral measurements. There are many ways you can observe the sun. The simplest and least expensive is to look at the sun in broadband with either a full aperture filter or a Herschel wedge on a refractor. This is an inexpensive entry into solar observing and shows sunspots, granulation, and faculae. The other way to observe the sun is at a selective wavelength. Most people doing narrowband look at the hydrogen alpha wavelength, which is what we'll be discussing in today's video. A small fraction of solar enthusiasts like to look at calcium K and other more obscure wavelengths, but those are outside the scope of today's discussion. Most people observe at the hydrogen alpha wavelength of 656.28 nanometers, which reveals filaments, prominences, flares, spicules, and active regions. To isolate this wavelength, you need an etalon, and that's where the real engineering differences begin. There are four main etalon approaches. One, tilt-tuned etalons. These are used in Lunt and Coronado scopes. They're simple and fast to adjust, typically on the objective of the solar telescope. Two, pneumatic pressure-tuned etalons. These are used in most Lunt and Coronado telescopes. They provide uniform tuning, they're fast to adjust, they can be modular, easy to double stack, and can produce some spectacular images. Three, mechanical pressure-tuned etalons. These are used in older Coronado designs and the newer Heliostar solar telescopes. They apply controlled mechanical pressure to the etalon plate and spacers, slightly compressing the cavity and shifting the passband. They are easy and quick to adjust and can produce some great images with a single stack. Fourth, we have solid fabry perot etalons. When made properly, these can produce extremely narrow band passes down to 0.3 angstroms, ideal for high resolution H-alpha work. Unlike the first methods, which are usually integrated into telescopes, Mica-based etalons are designed to work with an existing refractor telescope. Fifth, we have the spectroheliograph, which I've covered previously in another review. Spectroheliographs can create spectacular images in several wavelengths, but they can't be used for visual, so I'm not including them in today's discussion. The two main players in solid mica etalons are Daystar and Solar Spectrum. The Daystar Quark comes in two models, prominence or chromosphere. The prominence model is supposedly optimized for prominences with a wider band pass, and the chromosphere model a narrower band pass for surface details. Yet, my experience suggests, and most online reports agree, the chromosphere model does a fine job on prominences too. One friend of mine who owned a prominence model was very unhappy with its performance and he sold it, but others report satisfaction. The unit I'm looking at in this review is a quark chromosphere. 
Both systems rely on solid mica fabry puro etalons to achieve the narrow band passes required for chromospheric viewing. Solid hydrogen alpha etalons are made with mica. Why mica? They use mica because mica uniquely provides ultra-flat surfaces, which gives you natural cleavage planes. It's very stable, which is ideal for thermal tuning. It has correct refractive index, which enables sub-angstrom spacing. It's durable, tolerating repeated heating, and it has high finesse, which gives you moderate birefringence. No other material checks all of these boxes. But mica varies in translucency, flatness, uniformity, and inclusions. And mica is difficult to cleave consistently. Solar Spectrum selects extremely light, transparent, highly uniform mica, spectroscopically tested. Daystar publicly states that they sort mica pieces into bins, such as SE grade and PE grade, which go into different product lines. Before we go further, I want to discuss FWHM, which is full width at half maximum. It measures the width of the transmission curve at 50% of its maximum height. A smaller FWHM gives you a narrower band pass and higher contrast. A larger FWHM gives you a wider band pass and lower contrast. This will matter a lot when we compare two systems. Let's talk now about thermal control. This is an important thing for mica-based etalons. The Daystar Quark is heat only. It has a strip heater. It takes, in my experience, about 10 to 12 minutes to come on band. It can only heat, it can't cool. When the telescope warms the etalon, it can drift off band because the temperature is not regulated. And retuning even 0.1 angstroms requires another multi-minute wait. If it's very cold, it may never come on band, and some users report in hot climates it's difficult to keep the unit on band during long sessions as the telescope heats up. The quark is known to have limitations with respect to temperature extremes. Their manual says, I quote, if after 20 minutes settling the LED has not turned green, the ambient temperature may be too hot or too cold for the quark to regulate temperature. The solar spectrum overcomes this limitation through the use of a thermoelectric controlled oven, or a TEC oven. The TEC system provides active thermal regulation, meaning it can both heat and cool the etalon as required. This active regulation is managed by a dedicated controller, which maintains the oven set point to within 0.1 degrees C. It is a true thermoelectric oven, comes on band in about one minute, it maintains wavelength to within 0.1 degrees C. It's immune to tube heating and ambient shifts in temperature. And it's perfect for long time lapses or mosaics when you need consistency. I've used mine in 110 Fahrenheit Arizona summers and in below freezing conditions at 7,500 feet with zero drift. In this illustration, notice how the tech stabilizes the wavelength almost perfectly, whereas heat-only systems can show cyclic drift over time, especially as the telescope heats up. This explains why the quark time lapses can slowly lose contrast unless frequently checked and adjusted. Let's now talk about tuning speed. With pressure or tilt etalons, the tuning is instant. With the solar spectrum, it takes about one minute. With the quark, in my example, it takes 10 to 12 minutes to come on band initially, and then multiple minutes to settle after any dial change. This matters for prominences, active regions, and mosaic work. Now let's talk about bandwidth and FWHM comparisons. The quark chromosphere is officially unspecified. They say that it should be typically 0.45, but we find in real world measurements that it's unit dependent and is often well over one angstrom. 
Solar spectrum is available in 0 0.65, 0 0.5, or 0.3 with explicit specs supplied. Note how narrower FWHM gives you much higher contrast and broader FWHM leaks more of continuum, reducing detail. My solar spectrum is 0.3 angstroms, which is much narrower than a typical quark. Quark owners report a wide range of experiences. Some units perform beautifully. I searched for a long time before finding my quark, and I'm happy with it. It has produced some wonderful images, especially when double stacked with my Lunt Tilt Edelon. Other quarks, however, show sweet spots, banding, uneven contrast, and off-band performance. These mixed experiences are well documented in the community. Check the notes for this video for links on discussions on quarks. Solar spectrum, by contrast, spectrometer tests every etalon and visually tests with a telescope on the sun before shipping anything. My only service experience with Daystar was receiving a new solar flat cap that had obvious scratches in it. I tried to return it and the distributor told me that Daystar does not accept returns. But after some discussion, the distributor agreed to exchange it for me for another one which turned out to be acceptable. Others on the forums report service experiences ranging from highly satisfied to highly dissatisfied. One such misadventure can be found in the notes to this video. Understanding Specifications Daystar's SE grade tolerance is specified as quote, within plus or minus 0.5 A of the full aperture average. There are two important nuances to note here. First, the full aperture average is not specified. The full aperture average may not be perfectly centered on 656.28 nanometers. Local regions are allowed to vary plus or minus 0.5 from that average, assuming that it meets spec. So an SE grade etalon, like a quark chromosphere, can be slightly off-band overall, plus have regional variation, resulting in some units being noticeably shifted from the ideal H-alpha line. This is not a manufacturing defect, it's simply how SE grade is defined by Daystar. Note that there is no limit to how much the full aperture average could be offset from the desired value. This explains results, like are described next. There are a lot of anecdotal comments about quark quality. Public measurement data has been provided by Christian Veladrich, who is a solar expert and editor of the book Solar Astronomy. He measured multiple narrowband filters, and there's a link in the notes. You'll see that of eight quark units tested, two met spec and six did not. The professional grade version, which should have been less than 0.5, was actually measured at 0.95, almost two times out of spec, and one of the standard SE quarks, which was supposed to be less than 0.5, was actually 2.1, over four times out of spec. The average performance of the six SE grade quarks was 1.02A, twice the expectation of 0.5A. These are actual measurements, not observer comments or anecdotes and they align well with community claims of unit-to-unit -unit variation. Daystar documentation actually says the chromosphere FWHM is not specified. Now let's talk about blocking filters. The Daystar quark design is a soft-coated two-cavity filter. It has about 45% peak transmission, more of a sinusoidal profile, has more continuum leakage, is more sensitive to humidity and aging, has a typical lifespan of five to 10 years, and the blocking filter is excluded from the warranty. Solar Spectrum has a hard-coated three-cavity blocking filter. It has transmission of 90 to 96%, more of a rectangular profile, very low continuum leakage, a very long life of 20 plus years expected, and is warranted completely for five years. This is one of the reasons we'll see why 
my solar spectrum image is much brighter than a quark image at the same settings, despite it being a much narrower etalon. Let's show some real-world brightness comparisons. The brightness differences come from having a hard-coded blocker in the solar spectrum, having better centering, having higher transmission throughput, and having more stability over time. Now let's talk about build differences. The quark includes an etalon with a strip heater, a soft-coated blocking filter, a built-in 4.3 times telecentric, a tuning knob, and an LED status light. The solar spectrum includes a tech-controlled etalon, a hard-coated blocker, and a controller box. The solar spectrum requires an external telecentric. Both units require energy rejection filters on the objective if your telescope is beyond 100 millimeters in aperture. Note that the stacking order of components is different. The quark places the internal blocking filter element ahead of the telecentric lens system. In solar spectrum configurations, the blocking element is situated after the telecentric, an arrangement which is widely regarded as a superior design for optical path cleanliness and performance optimization. Note that Daystar has a Quantum PE series, which is their very high-end premium professional line. The Quantum PE series includes a heater cooler and achieves performance closer to a solar spectrum at 0.3 angstroms. The cost? $36,000. This compares to my solar spectrum 0.3 angstrom unit, which retails for $4,380. So who is each system targeted for? The Daystar Quark is targeted at beginners and hobbyists. It's a low-cost entry into high-res H-alpha if you already have a small refractor. Very portable and lightweight, relatively easy to use. It's slowest to come on band of any HA system. It experiences tuning drift with time and temperature. It has a five-year warranty, excluding the blocking filter and trimmer. And it has no performance guarantee. Buyer awareness is recommended. The solar spectrum is targeted to serious solar enthusiasts or researchers. It provides superior images with high uniformity and contrast. It has perfect thermal stability. It has brighter images for the same band pass, but it has longer lead times for availability. It's a higher cost. It's heavier and bulkier. It has performance you can trust. It has long-term durability with hard-coded components and a five-year warranty on everything with an eight-year warranty on the Edelon. Both products have their place. Now here's my takeaway. The Daystar Quark has brought hydrogen alpha observing to thousands of people and offers a reasonable value for the price. Although it should be said you can buy a complete 50 millimeter hydrogen alpha telescope from Lunt for less money. Many users are very satisfied with their quarks and I have a good one that has produced outstanding photos. However, community reports and independent measurements show significant unit-to-unit -unit variation and service concerns, so it's important to go in with realistic expectations. Solar spectrum etalons cost more and require an external telecentric, but in exchange, you get exceptional contrast, uniformity, and tuning stability. For serious solar enthusiasts, the difference is unmistakable. Whether you go with a tilt etalon, a pressure tuned etalon, or a solid etalon, hydrogen alpha solar observing is one of the most rewarding areas in astronomy. If you're considering a solid etalon design, I hope this comparison helps you choose the solution that best fits your needs. Thanks for watching.